so Kushnuda and Oslo, both of you are, are taking some very different approaches to what or how blockchain could be integrated into the, the filmmaking process. I'd like to start with each of you individually so we can learn more about your respective projects and then open it up to some, some broader questions afterwards. Um, why don't we start with you, Kushnuda? So, um, you're a filmmaker. And uh, you just made this film. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Um, thank you. Um, I made a short film called Detained, and I raised funds on uh, blockchain-based application token that you earlier were talking about. And uh, I just completed the film, and the short film is about uh, the two refugee siblings coming to the United States at the day of a travel ban. Uh, and they are uh, taken into custody at the airport. Um, it's a very short film, it's like 10 minutes, and uh, I started the project like November last year, and I completed it in uh, like the last week. So, um, <laughs> very recently. <though>. Very recently. <laughs> What, uh, what was the inspiration for the film? Is it, a, is it a personal story at all? Not personal, but when the um, travel ban happened, I'm also uh, on the student visa. So, and then it, it kind of like uh, scared me <laughs> uh, because I was like, oh, I, now I cannot go back home and how can I travel as easily as I used to? Um, and I'm not from the countries that are on the list, but still I was like, uh, I heard stories that people cannot come even if they're not on the list. So that was like um, something that motivated me to look into this and kind of um, try to use my art, kind of express the situation because um, it's very hard, first of all, to uh, attain a visa, a U.S. visa, and not many people know. Um, a lot of efforts, a lot of paperwork, and a lot of money. And uh, being able to get that and come here, and then it, it's um, and then being in the airport, and they tell you that you cannot come in. Um, that's kind of very scary. So I did some research about the people who had went through this the first night, and I read a lot, and then I, I wrote my uh, short film uh, based on the true events. So um, that's kind of like also at the same time I was going to renew my visa, so it was kind of tricky, because myself, I was scared of making a movie about people being stopped, and then like I have to prove to the um, US Embassy that uh, I'm an artist, and uh, I'm making a movie about the uh, U.S. Uh, you know um, visa process. So it was kind of tricky for me to renew my visa in a way. Like I was like living the same situation as my characters were in wow. a way. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a very uh, timely film, both for you personally and then in terms of current events as well. Um, so you touched on it a little bit earlier, but just sort of in brief. How is it that you're utilizing blockchain, or how did you utilize blockchain for, for your film? Um, well, I didn't know about blockchain like much. Uh, I just started learning about it two years ago, and uh, it was only thanks to Singular TV because at that time they were just uh, starting as a startup, and I was um, filming some interviews with uh, the experts of blockchain, and this is where I learned about blockchain. And the more I learned, the more I started educating myself about it and how it can help filmmakers, um, especially filmmakers, young filmmakers like me who just finished college and trying to pursue filmmaking and it's, um, you don't have a big fan base as well. Although I had some documentary short films that I did, um, they were kind of here there, but still um, it wasn't enough to get funding for the next film, especially if you're making a human rights related to movies or documentaries, you don't get much uh, interest, like funding. So, and then like, when Singular TV was coming up to this idea of uh, launching an application like Talkie, where you can fundraise your, uh, any content that you wish as an artist, I just took the opportunity and um, 
I offered my uh, services as a filmmaker. <laughs> and Singularity TV was because also like I trusted them, the co-founders are also filmmakers, and they were also having a hard time to finance their own films, and that made them to create Singularity TV. I felt really, tr I trusted them. So not knowing much about the blockchain, rather than just the cryptocurrency, kind of helped me to trust them because they're filmmakers and they understood what I'm going through. So that's why I, I kind of learned more about it. And that was the first test case, uh, one of the first test cases for token application where I fundraised my film. Um, and uh, it was just a learning process. So I was like learning more and more about the application before going to um, a launch. And then when Tokit itself kind of launched, I was uh, uh, my project was launched right before, like after it. So it was kind of an experience in a way, and I was very happy to be part of that. Even if it didn't make any like money, for me it was just being part of this technology that I just learned about it was really fascinating. I, I hope it continues to be a, a positive learning experience. Um, but let's switch over to you, Oslin, for a moment. Um, you've got a very different project. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Genie Paper Studios and Haynes Paper Studios? Yes, uh, welcome everyone. Um, as a disclaimer, I'm not trying to sell anyone anything here. I'm just trying to say. Um, I am a real estate developer. I build buildings. I get land on the zone. And, um, uh, about 25 years ago, a company came to me and said, we're making a movie and we need space. And we have these old warehouses that I had and I, nobody knew what to do with them, but I always like to invest in things that nobody wants and turn them around and we're opportunists. So that's how I got involved in the, in, in, in the film industry because I was supplying the film industry with places to make movies. So um, over the years, uh, the market has migrated because I built sound stages and this young lady here would come to me or the producer or director and say, listen, we need to, um, we need space, we need a sound stage, we need office space, we need, you know, to make a film. So I would get my rent money right off the top and I would rent the space of the film to companies and they would make their movies. And over the years, as time goes by, I also would like to invest in other ventures. So I started a technology company while well, these kids needed space and they came to me they couldn't afford it and i gave them space and in return i gave them a salary and then they started fooling around with technology html and all this other stuff and uh, so my foot was always in technology and real estate and i invested in a company that i was startup i had was delivering content on a mobile device with no apps or download and that's when um, Apple did not want to play any videos or YouTube on their phone. I'm, a, I'm an upset or a disruptor. And um, I started doing that, and as the film industry was getting more and more mature, um, I noticed that um, they, they were trying to, they built a lot of these film studios in abandoned warehouses and out of town. And uh, we had one space in downtown Toronto, because Toronto, as I call it, with North, because they give a lot of film rebates. Uh, incentives to make films and stuff like that. So everything just like organically fell into my lap. And um, getting to know the film makers, they were very finicky, exact people. They say they wanted space, they wanted at that time. Everything has to be exact because they're spending millions of dollars a day making a film and they, you know, even my space is only 30 grand. They're spending a million behind that and everything has to be exact. So I saw a lot of um, fragmentation in the industry. Like they would, they would have to render the accommodation for the stars in another location, offices in another location, and everything. So um, in Toronto, the real estate is getting crazy, so we're getting bought up. They're buying these spaces from us and putting up high rise buildings. So what I did, I took, I bought a 50 acre piece of land, and I took all the pieces that's needed in the film to make content. So there's a sound stage. There's office space, there's five-star accommodations, there's accommodations for the crew, there's an underground subway system, because when they shoot the subways, they have to take the subways down, and they can only do it a certain time. I put a pool in, I'm putting a pool in, and I've also um, you know, put a data center in, a whole ecosystem.
legal system I'm designing right now. And um, so what my idea is that they make the content, they put it on the data center and it's, it's streamed directly to the consumer. Those are the independent um, producers. So basically it's a hub where you come and you make everything in one location. So this gentleman, single company does, Thomas does, he, he, I'm the other side of it. I'm the physical location. So when he doesn't have my, my facilities is what makes the content so that he can distribute the content to his, uh, to his, um, his audience, to his consumers. Right. So it's definitely a, it's a, it's a very practical roll-up of all of the physical infrastructure that you need in order to facilitate filmmaking. Yes. But, um, but how are you implementing blockchain technology in that? Okay. What we do is that once an uh, independent producer or content creator with gaming, because motion capture, he develops his content and he has it finished. I have a data bank, and on that data bank, he can put his content. And it's, 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 it's a blockchain and, and smart contract, which means if he puts his content on my data bank, then if he streams it directly to the consumer, it's blockchain for security and smart contract for settlement. So when, it, when that, if he, if he's, um, stream it directly to the consumer when they pay him for using or, uh, for that content it's settled with all the stakeholders so if you're a producer, if you're a costume, if you're an actor everybody get instant settlement through the smart contract and the blockchain is security. Also on one of the, uh, the data bank we have is an exchange so once he puts the content on it, Hulu, Netflix, any one of the OTT operators can bid for the content and the winner will settle automatically on the smart contract and on the blockchain. And some of the uh, situations cr over across what Thomas Company does, because we track the IP, we, um, we manage the intellectual rights, as well as a number of different things, that even licensing. So which means if a guy puts his content out, and some of it is going to be branded content, like if somebody makes a short film or a short, you know, or a 20-minute movie or whatever, an hour movie, or whatever he does, he can sell it to a company that would brand that movie, and you know, so he makes an income coming in from that, and he, and um, so he uses a lot of um, analytics AI to track that, so they can see the analytics. Because as Thomas was saying, um, Netflix don't give you those; they don't give you those analytics, so you don't know what the customers really want. So give you a chance to really make what you're doing, and also, like I was saying before, some of the the actual physical content, the, 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 the uh, creative content, there's blockchain attached to that piece of, 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 the, uh, of, the, um, of the film that goes out that people are watching. And uh, if somebody steals a piece of it and try to embed it in their content, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to, to catch them. So there's a lot of things that are being developed. And it's going to take also a lot of the, the artists and the creative people to also help implement it, those things. Because even in our a hub, we have an academy, so we, you know, we have an incubator, so we want as a collaborative course, so um, you can help develop a lot of the technologies that are going to work through the system. I was at MIPCOM uh, a few weeks ago, and you know, I did a couple of presentations, and the independent film companies, uh, producers, I mean creators, they can do so much to bring their own content, because Netflix and all these, comp and all these uh, OTT don't really know what the consumers want. You know, so it gives an independent person a chance to build their own audience and also implement blockchain where they see it possibly can work. Like some people, some creators are going to want to use maybe um, um, maybe a different kind of platform for the smart contract depending on the deal that they make. So if a branding company comes in and says, okay, we're going to do some placements, but we want this much, it's going to get funded. And they can do certain things. And we're using what we call a security token, because the real estate that produces the income brings an income in, and they also can use those tokens to make the film also too. So it's a security token against the real estate. It's like a mortgage against the property when you invest in our tokens, and you get income coming in, plus you get also the, um, the streaming. Like we take a percentage of what the um, creator streams, so there's a multi different ways of income. So you share equity, you're an equity owner, but the coin only symbolically represents that percentage. Because if you have a mortgage for a million dollars, you can't sell part of it easy, right? With the coins, you can sell part of it, and everybody gets 
a first position on all the real estate in, in, uh, in order to participate. Just a, just a moment there, Oslin. So when Oslin mentions a security token, is that a term that everyone here is familiar with already? No. Would you, would you mind uh, defining that term for the audience then? Yes, there's a utility token, like you have a utility token that like the gentleman was talking about, the Cayman token. That's a token that doesn't have any asset behind it. Okay? A security token has a physical asset that's producing some sort of income. So if you buy a coin, any token on the um, coin exchange, you know what's the underlying value? Like this building has a value. It's a real estate, it's physical. You can go in, you can get your money back, you can do something with it, right? So, sorry about that, I didn't, I assume that you understood that. So there's two kinds of token, there's a utility token, and there's a security token. The security is secured against the real estate, because I'm a real estate person. If you invest your money with me, say, for example, I'm not asking you to, but I make sure you get a fair value exchange for your money. So tomorrow you wake up and say, I don't want to do it, you get your money back. It's a liquidity. Gives you a chance to get your funds back. Um, some of the industry like what I'm doing because they would buy the tokens and use the tokens for making the film. Because the token would price would go up, your, your cost to make your product is, is reduced. And also, a lot of the film companies, when like, like this gentleman was saying, when you make a film for 50 million, it costs 100 million to promote it. So, what film companies are doing because you're an independent filmmaker, it costs them so much money that they don't want to, they know they're going to lose the money because they don't have the distribution. Now with our situation and what they're doing, it's easier to recoup because you have the audience, you build an audience and you can you know, continue along. So you're going to see higher quality content. You're going to see people much more comfortable because if the filmmaker knows that he's going to make his fifth film, he's going to be more relaxed, he's going to be more you know, more creative and, you know, it's not pressure because you have to, you know, produce this thing out and it looks, it looks, it looks rushed. But if you look something that's well crafted, it's going to come up with that. So all this OTT stuff over the top, away in your mobile device, is going to get higher quality. It's going to get so good, especially with 5G coming in because you can compress more, deliver more, and do more. And, and also, a lot of independent filmmakers, you can get into gaming because it's motion capture. Um, there's a gentleman I'm actually waiting to come right here, and we've got our service can serve 3D. So you watch a film on 3D on a mobile device. So we're looking at a lot of things going forward that's going to be a major um, disruption because, you know, Netflix is fine, but if you create something and you're going to give it to Netflix and you're going to get, say, 100,000, you can go directly to the consumer because you have a following, you know? Like, look at Issa Rae. We were at the uh, Milcom. And she got the personality of the year. But look how she's got started, you know? She's a real upsetter. And anybody in this room can do that. You know, if you only limit what you're doing to your mind. When I started in real estate, nobody wanted the real estate. Me, I like things that nobody wants, because I want to turn it around. And everybody can turn anything around anytime. And if you can, listen, you, you guys have so much creative energies to make things happen, it's incredible. Because the studios, they can't produce good stuff. That's why they're buying stuff outside of the studio. Because they they just, it's like inbred. How much, how many good quality stuff they need to do. So his company, what they're doing is so important because I've got the physical part, he has the other part. So we, we're collaborating and it's coming out in the, in the system. So I see the physical real estate. He has the other aspect of it, of being able to bring things through the process. And I think it's all about everybody decentralizing and joining together because if we make these filmmakers, these um, gaming creators, and any kind of technology that you can, any kind of medium you can create to impart to communicate with people, that's so important. So, so let's bring Hoosh back into the conversation in, in just a moment because I did want to, I did want to offer some additional uh, clarity on the definition for security tokens. Securities are traditional financial instruments like stocks or mortgages. They're regulated, um, often the body that's regulating them, it, it's very country to country in the United States, that's the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Committee. Um, and so the, the future for tokens that resemble securities is interesting and uncertain right now in the United States 
because it's not clear how these, these emergent new technologies will fit neatly into the regulatory boxes put in place. But so Oslin was just talking a lot about opportunity within the, within the film industry. Um, Hushnuda, what, what do you see for potential opportunities for, for filmmakers with, with blockchain technology? I think blockchain technology gives uh, artists like, freedom to create content they want and then direct um, communication with their audience peer to peer. And basically, I think we make films as a filmmaker, I can say, for the audience more. And then I never, I'm so glad that I never went the traditional way and I started this blockchain. <laughs> um, because a lot of friends I have, they made films and the films made good money or went to good festivals and they supposedly have to have make another one but they never made another one and they never got funding. Um, and I think blockchain kind of enables that because you're going to have fans and they're going to be looking forward to your next and the next projects. And I think um, it's very important. Like I'm educating my filmmaker friends because when they ask me how did you make your film and I say I did it in blockchain and then I say like, oh, we did the fundraise and the fundraise was using cryptocurrency and they get like, ah, oh, what is this? Um, and most of them don't even know about blockchain. So. Um, I usually like try to explain uh, what I know because I'm still learning about blockchain and the possibilities it can uh, do for. And I think the most important one is the rights and revenue um, and royalties. I think that's uh, something that filmmakers can have and control of their content and do what they really, want, how they really want to make films, not uh, how they've been told to make the film. I think it's very important. I think we've we've talked a lot about the positives of, of blockchain and, and what you are both working towards um, and how you're implementing blockchain. I'm curious, maybe switching gears slightly towards some of the negatives. What do you see as some, some big challenges for implementing the technology in the space? You you touched upon it a little bit um, just there, Kay, talking about education. What other challenges do you guys see in the space? Uh, blockchain is not not going to work in every case because I, I think it has some drawbacks in other cases, but. The major thing that we focused on is being able to control the intellectual property. And when somebody uses or buys the content, you're getting rewarded for the work that, you, that you're selling. Because right now, the distributors make most money out of the film. And you know you want a proper accounting, immutable accounting. So every film that's been shown on the device, it can be tracked. It can you know exactly what everything is done. It's accountable every which way. Now, blockchain is going to. You know, we're going to also depend on ideas, like in other words, it's, it's, it's logic. Like if you are making a, like we, we say example, if you're writing a script and you can use editing in blockchain, it's not going to work every, in every sense, but there would be ideas people will come up with and um, and then you can try to implement and see if this blockchain work on it. And I do to be some test cases. You will have negative, but you know, a lot of the, the negative the positive of the way those negatives because you're still being accountable. You can still you you're quantifying something. It's like mathematics, you know. You can't change it. You know, it's not it's not uh, subjective. It's very clearly defined. And if it's clearly defined, you know, is there negativity to something that clear, clearly defined? It could be negative impact or it could be positive impact. But it's clearly defined. So to me, blockchain is going to clearly define certain things. You know. Um, for example, if you need to, if maybe there's a, people might be interested in a certain subject and they want to get a film made, but maybe all the people who's interested in investing may, you know, may not be in one country. So, um, so for some countries that don't want to see something made, yeah, blockchain is going to be negative. But if something, somebody wants to see something made, it's going to be positive. But blockchain is going to probably have another name in 20 years from now or whatever years from now. But to me, there is negative things, and I'm trying to think about negative things, everything about blockchain, but every time I keep working and, and experimenting, I see where I can use it. I see where it comes in because it is, somebody's going to validate what I'm doing. You know, like if something sucks, you have to, when I was in university, we were, when we were doing things in psychology, if we wanted to know the truth, we asked a bunch of kids and presented to them and they tell us. But adults, they will just you know tell us something a little bit different. So, 
you know, there's going to be negative parts about it, and it's going to evolve. And uh, to me, the negative things things is when people try to scam it. Like, you know, if you change one of the nodes in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hash, it ain't going to work because everybody else knows that it doesn't. You know, so I'm looking to see, you know, where where there can be where things doesn't work. But sometimes it's just I'm trying to think negative in order to think to see what it can be done. But sometimes I just can't find it. You know, and I'm really looking for it. You know, I'm looking to see, you know, how I can get through the system. And sometimes it doesn't come up. But I listen to people and I'm looking for it. So we all need to to see where is blockchain is going to be negative. How can it not work? in some ways, because we want to find out. But to me, blockchain is a mathematical exactness, is an exact science. It's either yes or no, and there's not a lot of gray areas. But if you use it for negative purposes, you will eventually get caught. You might get away with it to start, but in other words, you're going to be accountable. And to me, blockchain is, a, is, a, is, is accountable in certain aspects, depending on how you use it. I, uh, I think I think your point about the, the scamminess is a, is a good one because um, it's sort of it's kind of tainted the brand of, of blockchain with with all of these sort of fraudulent initial coin offerings in the yes. space and, and stuff like that. I think that's definitely that that uh, branding and reputational challenge is one that the space has to reckon with moving forward. Um, uh, Ken, did you want to add anything? I know you mentioned the educational challenge yeah. earlier. Because like in, in the entertainment too, it's very new um, and term, and people don't know blockchain. They know Bitcoin, and also it doesn't have very good up, like um, what is the word? Connotation. Yeah, um, and I've been like trying to tell them there's a technology behind it and it allows it to function, and other really good publications um, that could help the makers, and there are more and more. And I think the main challenge is to educate people, and especially entertainment, and there have been already so many times it's a light, <laughs> and then um, things that they were promised and never worked. Um, so it was hard, it's, every time it's hard to um, kind of tell my uh, friends, filmmaker friends about blockchain and try to explain in an easy way that I understand that it's uh, don't be too skeptical and try it. It's not gonna of course solve your problems or like anything, but it's er the earlier you educate or just read about it and learn about it, it's uh, it's very good to know and be part of it earlier than later be like, oh I you know, I messed well, up. I'd like to add something. I got into involved in blockchain in 2006 around and, and how I got involved in it is because uh, just about when the crash was coming uh, we were putting content on the mobile device including uh, conversation and we were looking for an encryption solution and I went to a meeting and they were trying to create something that uh, it was I think forward 96 or 256 encryption and it started out with trying to secure something and in order to get it built we need a lot of collaborators. So in other words, you couldn't get paid for helping. You didn't get paid for helping, so you got a virtual currency, like a virtual money. Okay, it's a promise that you're going to get something if it became successful. And that's what it started. But what ended up being, we built the technology was built that could be used for a lot of different purposes. And that's really what Bitcoin is about. But it was limited until Ethereum came in and made it that you could use it for other stuff. So it's just basically a piece of technology that you could use for something else. Like SAP, Oracle, that costs money to make. That could have been the Bitcoin for today, just to give it a name. But everybody was a, was a piece of technology that everybody would be, would be immutable in any thing that we do. So Bitcoin never started out as saying it's going to be a coin. We we're trying to build technology, and in order to get paid for the technology, you got the Bitcoin. If you take this piece of land, and build something on it. You got the architect, you got the engineer, you got everybody that's collaborated, interior designer. Suppose we didn't have any money to pay off. You'd get a percentage, you'd get a percentage, you'd get a percentage of the building, and all of a sudden we got a building, and it's creating rent now. So Bitcoin, the technology, as they use it to do things, it get gas, it gets miners and everything to make it work. So it was a technology that was basically created, and how do you get you know, paid or compensated a virtual currency that they name a Bitcoin or a coin. And that's the same thing. 
But that phase has gone to be what it is. So now people, because of the technology, we can implement it in different things to make it work. You know, it's all, it's like farming. You got the land, you put some help, you put the seeds, you put something else, and we work together to produce something. And that's basically when, that, when I got involved in that aspect of it. We were trying to build a software that everybody could work on. SAP costs money to build. So, you know, but only one company owns it, or Oracle, right? Same thing, if you collaborate and help with something, we build it. If all of us got to, together here, and, and, and I have the piece of land behind here, which I can't afford in Brooklyn anymore, and you come, you're, you know, you're a construction company, you, you can do drywall, you can do electrical, you can do plumbing. It's the same basic way. We collaborate to help each other, and when we get at the end, we all share it, sell it, split it, or live in it. And that's basically the most simplest way that I can get into is the underlying technology that comes from it. If we all collaborate and build a building, we now create something that is amazing. It we got something that is aligning economic incentives. That's all it was. It's nothing like that. And because you see what's happening now, the younger people, when technology started, we were all broke. But now we got money. So I think Wall Street and all those guys are against it because they know it's going to work. And the people are not broke. And it's a different, different paradigm. I, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to open it up to uh, questions from the audience since I think we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, I want to um, correct something you said. In the distribution business, the distributors don't make the money. I'm just going to be real simple. I'll only talk about the actual. Forget about the rest of it. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. You guys are going to get hurt. I'm sorry. Power this. In the theatrical business, mm -hmm. you have your film. The people who make the money is the real estate. If I have a superhero picture at a studio, mm -hmm. I will get 90% of the box office. If it's not a superhero picture, I will get 55% of the box office. If I'm an independent, which I am, I get 35% of the box office. Well, for so one. The, the theater chain is taking 65% of that money right off the top. And when they brought digital projection into it, we are still paying a fee to pay off those projectors. Yes, sir. You know what? I really feel, I feel, I feel the pain for you because the, the big blockbuster movies that comes in the theaters, I'm a, I'm a landlord, right? And what ended up happening is that the guy tells me that I rent the space to, he said, listen, they're bringing out a movie. I'm only going to make the money from the popcorn and the drinks, okay? I understand that. They, they, they're going to, you know, so I understand that because the first week the movie comes out because of the, the distributor said that he spent so much money in advertising, the guy that owned the exhibitor is only going to make the money on the popcorn. No, no, no. That's yeah. only the big film. The big film. Most but of the films in the theaters are not big films. It's like on Broadway. Yeah, I know. It, the it, owners of Broadway theaters make all the money. They charge $100,000 a week to put your play in there. Yeah. So the small play, the producer of the play, or the distributor is not making the money. Only if you're Warner Brothers and you have the superhero picture can you demand 90% of the box office. Yeah, I can understand that. And that's a small percentage of what's on the screens. 16%, I know that makes most of the money. And I, I, listen, I understand and I think that the, the exhibitors, you know, it's, it's what we're doing with some of the exhibitors, like the, 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 the film, the, the, the theaters, we're trying to redevelop those into high rise buildings. No, you know? What you're also telling the filmmakers is that, oh, bypass the distributor because they're taking all your money. No, I'm not saying that, sir. You don't explain to the filmmakers oh, okay. the cost of money Absolutely. to do marketing is the way your film's going to get seen. Now, I'm, without <coughs> counting all the films that get dumped into New York every week, it's about 40 films a week. Singular's got a film out there now. The key question is, who the hell did the marketing on it? Yeah, no those science things. fiction films that opened up last week. Absolutely. Yeah, you're people people uh, this weekend. There's been no press on it, no marketing, and I spent all my time in theaters talking to total strangers and saying, excuse me, sir, how did you hear about this film that's on the screen? They saw no press. They saw no reviews, they saw no marketing, they just happened to be in the theater week before. You go to AMC Empire, 25 screens. They're opening up films on Friday that I'm there every week. They ran no trailers, no posters, and nobody's seeing the films. So why are you spending money putting in the theater? So stop telling filmmakers the strippers are fucking them over. No, no. Because they're not. No, no, sir. You are going to be very important because you understand the system and you can help. You see, that's what I'm saying. The point is that I understand what you're saying. But some of the people coming to us 
say to us that they make a film and they give it to the distributor, license them, they got nothing. So what you're doing is very important. No, no, that's because they're going to sales agents and they don't do their homework. Yeah, you're right, but if sir. Half of this if half of sales agents. Wait a second. You're right. You know, and a person like you, I want to talk to you because what you can do and bring to the system as a collaborative court is very important that you're exactly right. You know exactly what to do, and that's what we needed. Listen, the, the crypto has to still deal with the bank, okay? So, no, 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 I'm, not, I'm just giving an example, but I'm saying, I'm, listen. How do I convert crypto into dollars to pay my landlord? Crypto's great, but I can do all the bitcoins and everything. Sir, you're absolutely right. I can't convert to the hard cash and everybody's free. Absolutely, but what I'm saying to you, your skill sets, right, that right, you have right now, okay? I'll sit and talk to you because you're exactly right. That's what's needed in, 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 in the circle. What you do is very important. You said something important, and that's about marketing, getting the information out. You're very important in the cycle. You're staying out of it, but we want you in. We want you to become part of that, because that's another problem. I, I we think need we are you. going to have to move on to, to other questions, just because I don't. But we need you. I want to talk to you. We need you. Conversation. I would just add here that it's it's no accident that many of the use cases you've heard earlier today from blockchain for media refer more to disrupting digital distribution because that's the, the more immediate uh, implications of the technology. I think, um, I think the, the criticisms that you've brought up of theatrical distribution are very, very salient. There are a number of issues with theatrical distribution within the US in particular, but um, I think it's, it, it's again no accident that blockchain companies see the opportunity more on the side of digital distribution because it's about that. I think, I think the frustration that I hear from this yeah, gentleman is, correct. It is something even beyond media, though, right? Which is, okay, if I, let's say I spoke to a real estate developer in, in Panama two days ago. He got paid in Bitcoin for a piece of real estate, because that's what the person could pay, and he was willing to take it. But he can't go down to the grocery store and spend that. If he's going to buy a yacht, you know, or a car, or something big, that's like an easy transaction today. But I think the issue is, is that we have to convert the money from fiat into cryptocurrency to then be able to use it, right? And it's the fact that we have these two economies going. We've got the old paper one, and we've got this new one over here. And if we can just get everybody to do it over here, yeah, with some magic wand, how do we do that? Then that economy is gonna work. Yeah. But the killer app we're looking for is how can the money be made inside the crypto economy itself? But we got to pull them into, we got to pull them into the circle. Well, and I think, though, to bring this frustration into your topic is that that piece that you guys are working on, I think, is sort of how do you get those worlds to bridge inside the blockchain world, as opposed to it, it definitely is. Um, I mean, back to the question about challenges for the technology. Definitely, um, uh, even cryptocurrency as a use case for blockchain technology has not quite achieved uh, currency status. So yes. definitely, a lot of a lot of work to do there, and perhaps um, education and adoption are, are the main challenges. But we have to look at the exhibitors, though. I think, to be fair, the exhibitors that own these physical spaces, they were like the, they, they started everything, and to me, I like inclusivity because it, it, it makes everything work, because his, his skill sets and what he's been through is gonna help me produce a better product and better all around for everyone, because you're gonna still have all of, like, for example, we do gaming, which is, um, uh, motion capture for gaming, and that's out of the home experience. So some of these things that happen can, you know, bring a lot of things. And from a film studio point of view, I got gamers come to me, and they'll spend a hundred thousand dollars just on motion capture, but a game release can make five billion in a day. They got big budgets. They pay me ridiculous money just to come and do motion capture, and it, and out of the home experience is that they put these installation in and they, and they got jobs of people that come out and they have these things. So some of the ex exhibitors, they, they can reposition some of that space because a lot of out of home experience, but it's a conversation there. And I, and I like what you're saying because it helps me be better and look at things better. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities we, and we just have to work it differently. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, so we are building, sounds to me you are building a good um, environment to support in, uh, independent filmmakers, you know, through the uh, blockchain distributed kind of nature. But actually, sir, I went to a lot of the major studios. That's where I got the money from. In the right. So the question is, 
say if this business really grow and be successful and be start to gain the financial power, mm -hmm. right? How can you avoid what you are building now to grow into another, um, say, Warner Brother, Brothers, mm -hmm. big, gigantic? Because, because the coins are going to be owned by a lot of different people. I don't want to be a Warner Brothers in that sense, but I want to be a Warner Brothers to produce good quality. And the point is that you know there's a lot more going on in the industry because it, it, with diversity you get creativity, you get different opinion, you get different styles, you get different opinions. I've been going to China for 20 years and I've watched how China have grown and I've, I've traveled, so I see difference, I see difference in everything. So the point being is that when you're more uh, diversified, you're going to get very good answers. They're going to be more exact. They're going to be decentralized. So we've seen, like, listen, the, the, the Warner Brothers, MGM, and all those guys, they had a place and they did something. Without those companies, we wouldn't know how to go, for, go forward. You know? There's so much good content out there that have been made. Like, I'm a TCM. There's no movies, you know? They're getting on the regular phone and talking. Those things can be redone to bring it up to, to what we are have today. But, you know, we have to look at the past in order to make the future good. So we're not gonna, we're not trying to be like the, those kind of establishment, but we didn't know what they have to go to in order to work like that. So we're gonna be more open. That's why, you know, I want independent film companies come, because I went to the big studios, they cut me a check, they bring me I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, Oscar, Sorry, but I think we are, we are approaching the end of our time, so I just okay. wanted to see if we had but any any other question from the audience? Perhaps uh, one of the women here. I'm afraid this is becoming Ladies, yes. increasingly male dominated panel. This one here, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, if I get it correctly, blockchain technology is being used for rights, revenue, and royalties. That's it. No, tracking the, tracking the content yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the content, that's my question. The storage of the content. How are you using blockchain to protect that storage? Because it's, you cannot use blockchain to storage anything. I mean, it, it will cost way too much. And I suppose you use your own storage. And what kind of um, uh, security or warranty are you giving to your creators that nobody's going to mess up with your silos or whatever you have to storage that content? And no third party is going to try to uh, mess with them and that you're going to have like uh, the IP protected, not just in the blockchain, like yes, royalty, revenues, and whatever, but the actual digital storage of the piece. Right, so is, is this a uh, question for Oslo or? Uh, okay. uh, well, we have, um, our data banks are set up in certain ways that, you know, um, with our, or when our content is on the data bank to be streamed, like normally if it goes out to Netflix or whatever, um, we use a lot of different solutions in order to, you know, to secure the data as possible. Anybody that uses the system of, say, like, for example, you, you make a, your film and you stream it to our data bank and the blockchain attached to each one of the downloads or each one of the, the, the you know, the, what you disseminate and distribute, it has a blockchain attached to that. And eventually, you'll, you'll see devices that if it doesn't match the blockchain, it's not going to work. You know, you can have certain things that are so. The security is going to get better and better. Like, I took a client of mine to China, and he's made movies. And he hasn't given the rights to China, but he was going to sell China the rights. And he said, they offer him a million and a half dollars. He wanted 10. So I said to him, well, how many movies he made? He said he made five. I said, OK, did you license any to China? He says, no. I said, go up there and see if you can find the movies. He found the movies, better quality than he has. So, you know, there's going to be um, things that's going to happen that, we, that and not everybody can control, but with your utmost um, um, care, you're going to be able to do it. So what we're doing with the blockchain right now, we're trying to encode every piece and every frame so that it all has to work together. So if somebody steals it, they're not going to be able to see the whole parts of it. And of course, you know, you're going to have offline storage also at the same time. You have your backups. You know, you do the best you can do in order to do that. But the main thing is that, you know, you know, you're going to you're going to be able to at least be more accountable than you are now for the content. And it's going to be best practice. You know, so when you you know, like like it's a collaborative situation where you're going to come in and say, listen, here's what we here's what we open. We need to get done, and we can, you know, we're going to work to get it done as far as possible. Sorry, go ahead. Um, 
kind of the technical part to answer that broad um, question. Um, but I feel like this, uh, I did my intellectual property. Uh, I tokenized myself as an artist and I tokenized whatever tokens I had and believing that um, supporters that supported me have not only supported me, but they support my art as well. So I feel like the whole idea of blockchain is the trust and that, you know, it helps me to put my, um, like, trust in it in a way. I don't know if I'm answering your question. In terms of um, a, a, a K as a filmmaker, so um, uh, not necessarily the nitty gritty of software development. Um, from my perspective, just the brief answer would be there is no blockchain out there today that's useful for content storage. While there are many good decentralized content storage solutions, and if you would like to talk more about that later, I'm, I'm happy to. But I think we will have to wrap up this panel, so I want to thank our panelists again. Thank you very much, Vishnuda and Mahasri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.